May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So who is this Jesus who is speaking in today's gospel? Do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Certainly he does not sound like the one whose birth was heralded by angels singing glory to God in the highest and peace to among those whom he favors. Nor is he like the Jesus, the one who at the end of Luke's gospel, after his resurrection, finds the disciples gathered together, appears to them, and proclaims, peace be with you. Many years ago, after the birth of my first child, I found my way to a weekday Bible study with some other young mothers. And the Bible study was led by a dear, well-intentioned layperson, who often used the phrase, oh, well, you will be led by your peace, a kind of comforting phrase. I think what she meant was that as a tool of discernment, there's this sense of peace that sometimes comes when we're facing a dilemma or decision and we might feel peaceful about one road or another. But I have to tell you, it was her go-to phrase, and I thought she just used it too often, as if in our choice to follow Jesus, we would always, always be led by some sense of peace. Even in my 20-something experience back then, that was only sometimes true, not always. My life had taught me that if I only rely on my sense of peace, that I would easily choose safety and security, or choose ways that make me comfortable, ways that I know. The God I knew, more often than not, challenged me to think differently and to feel differently and to act differently. The God I knew turned my world upside down. The deeper peace I sought did not come from easy answers or half-truths, but from real struggles and hard choices and uncertain paths. This Jesus, who speaks to us from the pages of the scripture today that we just heard Jean-Pierre read, does not speak about family relationships in the same way that he does in the parable of the prodigal son in the 15th chapter of Luke, when no disrespectful behavior, rejection, loose living in a foreign land or squandering of a fortune could keep the father from loving and forgiving and receiving his son back into his good graces. Doesn't sound like the Jesus who intervened in the family feud between Martha and Mary to keep them together, but acknowledging each other's gifts and a better way. This Jesus in today's gospel does, however, sound a little bit like Jesus in the 14th chapter of Luke, who turns to the large crowd that is following him all around and announces to them, whoever comes to me and does not hate, does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Mm, he does sound like the Jesus in Matthew, who when his mother and his brothers are, are coming and standing outside and trying to get in to speak with them, the Jesus who essentially shrugged and looked around the room and called all of those people his brothers and his mother, and then said to them all, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now, heaven is full of saints who have caused division in their families by following Jesus. 
I mean, St. Augustine started out by not following Jesus, and oh, his poor mother, St. Monica, had a fit, you know, uh, praying for him day and night that he would, he would give up his loose living and heed the call to Christianity. St. Francis, oh my gosh, he horrified his merchant father with his commitment to the poor, just horrified him. You may know the story of William Penn, whose father was worried because he was over there in England being very interested in the writings of John Fox, and so sent him off to the colonies to sort of shape him up. You know, it's the same um, William Penn who uh, founded Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, and lived out his life here in a way that his father never understood or approved of. And then there's my friend, Sister Marcia, whose wealthy family in Cincinnati was livid when she took her portion of her, of her estate into her women's community of Episcopal nuns. Following Jesus is not always good for family relationships. Many of us know well what it is like to be, for example, the only recovering person in an alcoholic family that thinks you're the one who's crazy. Or we may know what it's like to stand for Christian principles in a national political debate and find ourselves shunned at our family's dinner table or uninvited to a family event. So here again today, we have in this great Gospel of Luke, yet another example of the difficulty of following Jesus, of being a disciple. At the very least, we are left with Luke's crazy way of speaking and writing that shows us the upside-down nature of this crazy call we have to love everyone. And in today's lesson, we are given a descriptive text of what it is like to stand in favor of the poor and outcast, what it is like when we choose to eat with sinners and beggars, what it is like when we re reject the polite company that may be near us for a table with the homeless and lost. It costs something to follow Jesus. It may cost relationships in families. It often can bring division, not peace. So I want to share with you a lament, a deep lament, that I have almost every week, but certainly on the weeks when I am preparing a sermon for you. I never quite know how to tell you, in plain English, what good news this is, this life that we've been called to. What a great gift it is to lose something, to lose something that we thought was precious and that we couldn't live without what it's like to give up and give over all that we have, and sometimes even ourselves, for the sake of a wholeness that God calls us to, for the sake of a real life. I never know how to share with you the joy that comes with a life lived in service to others, not because it makes us feel better, but of course it does, but not because of that, but because at some level, way deeper than our feelings, when we do those things, our life resonates with God. It joins the rhythm of the universe that God created, this loving and forgiving that we are called to practice in deeds as well as thoughts and prayers. So maybe a good way to say it to you today is that this way that Jesus calls us to is a fearless way to live, a way without fear. And in that, there is this freedom, a freedom greater than any constitution can guarantee to us, a freedom that across 2,000 years and on every continent despite families and tribes and governments and empires of all sorts, a freedom 
that has captured the imaginations and the very lives of Christians. You know, Christianity is not a transaction. I can't give it to you, Pete. I can't negotiate it with you. Um, it's more like a good virus, a good virus that can be caught. It is a truth, a way of life that cannot simply be taught, but must be caught. It must capture us. And when it does, it invades every part of us so that nothing is the same. Family, oh, important, wonderful, often life-sustaining, but as we all know, can also be full of strife and violence. Family is important, but not the most important. Following Jesus, listening to God, practicing our faith, that really is what matters. That is what brings joy and a peace that may on the surface look not so peaceful, but deep underneath reflects a oneness with oneself and a unity with God and the universe. Loving is the great unifier. You know, all institutions, families, neighborhoods, governments, clubs, hospitals, your place of work, name something, all institutions, even churches, and maybe especially churches, establish their own equilibria. They, by nature, are institutions, are self-sustaining, and they reinforce not growth and change, but maintenance of their equilibrium. They have their own power structures and ways of keeping order. But what Jesus invites us to is a great reversal of those patterns, those ways of keeping order and those power structures. He invites us to upend those in favor of a life that benefits all of God's children that benefits all who are precious in God's sight. He invites us to nurture everyone's freedom and love. This Jesus in today's gospel is, after all, the same Jesus whose birth brought the heavenly bodies singing of peace, and in whose power of the resurrection peace was offered. It is the same Jesus, for whom nothing a son could do would separate him from his father's love, and who helps sisters find their way together. And it is the same Jesus, who knew and knows the world as it is, prone to division and strife. And thus, in this world, a Jesus who calls us, his followers, to seek the deeper peace, which really does pass our understanding, to seek to follow the one who goes all the way to the cross for the sake of love. It costs us something to follow Jesus, but fortunately we do not bear this cost alone. Besides the three-faceted God who daily beckons us moment by moment, we have our community, this imperfect church within which to practice our faith, to work at loving each other, at acknowledging and lifting up our different gifts, at accepting our varied perspectives. None of us is an expert in our own practice of loving and forgiving, at least not yet. Or if you are, raise your hand. I'd like to know you even better. But as our own kind of family, as brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, our common bond is with our striving, with God's help, to be a community where placing God first is the norm. And it just so happens that this imperfect church just may be one of those places 
wherein visitors, when they come, just might catch the good virus of Christianity in our midst. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.